three, two, one. What is up, everybody? It's the Raw Prospect Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Emmy Nixon. And joining me is Michael Wayne from Austin, Texas. And uh, today we're covering NFC Conference Championship. No, NFL Conference Championship games. Oh, man. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a great day tomorrow. The yeah. Right to go to the Super Bowl Fifty Five. This is these are the, really the two games that we wait for the entire year. These three games, this these two tomorrow, and then the Super Bowl. So yeah, it'll be fun. We're, we're going to dive into the games, um, NFC and AFC, and then make our predictions, and then we'll talk about. Um, some of the quarterback trade rumors, uh, the biggest of which is uh, Deshaun Watson, who wants out of Houston. Right. Um, so that- but before we before we get into the sports topics, some one thing I wanted to say is um, uh, we see that we're growing a little bit as a podcast. We actually have like twelve percent of our audience in Italy, apparently. So if you if you're listening right now and uh, you want to send in suggestions to the show, leave a comment or leave a, leave a review in like a, a question form. And, and uh, maybe we can, we can incorporate some of y'all's feedback. Cause uh, where we're trying to, we're still trying to find out like what, uh, what we want the overall um, scope to be of our podcast. But yeah, um, we'd love to hear y'all's feedback. But um, absolutely. Yeah, we're we're just gonna we're just gonna hop right in here. Um, which game you want to start with? Well, um, we'll start with the NFC Championship game that happens first um, tomorrow afternoon. I think it's like three o'clock or something like that. Right, right. Tampa Bay at Green Bay. Um, both of the bays. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll let you kind of start with this, um, your thoughts on the game and then your prediction. Um, this game is just, I don't know, this one feels like it's one of those games that's so hard to pick. It, I mean, you have two legendary quarterbacks, um, one of which is on a on first year in a new team. Um, and just like, honestly, this is the best he's played all year by far. And he's, he's just now getting into a a rhythm. And then on the other hand, you have Aaron Rodgers. probably this is the, this might be the best offense in terms of scheme we've ever seen Aaron Rodgers in. And I mean, I mean, that might not be saying much because he hasn't been in very, uh, creative offenses throughout his career but one thing I'd say is I like the matchup of Tampa Bay's corners versus these Green Bay wide receivers outside of Devonte Adams because you can kind of shadow Winfield their rookie safety deep on the side where Adams is on and then everybody else you just have to challenge and play one-on-one and from there, I, I like those matchups. I this this game is so hard to pick, man. I I honestly, I honestly don't care who wins. I I'd love to see it go either way. I just want a close game. But if I have to pick, I'd say Green Bay simply because I think that this is Aaron Rodgers' first championship game at home I believe I think this is first one of his entire career which is surprising but I think that plays a factor in the fact that this offense is just a complete team like this just on hitting on all cylinders um one thing I, w- I gotta say is Tampa Bay scored all of their touchdowns off of Saints turnovers last week the Green Bay is not gonna turn it over like three times. So 
they're going to have to find different ways to move the ball because it seemed like on the possessions where they didn't start in Saints territory, they couldn't really do anything. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, first of all, a couple little weird nuggets here. Um, both of these championship games are rematches of week six matchups, which is kind of, I just find that odd. Um, Tampa Bay played Green Bay in week six. Tampa Bay won that game going away 38 to 10. That was actually Aaron Rodgers' worst game uh, by far of the regular season. And uh, Buffalo played Kansas City in week six, and uh, Kansas City won that game 26 17. Now, as we've learned so far this postseason, um, those regular season matchups really have no bearing on what happens in these postseason games. Um, we saw what the Browns were able to do um, two weeks ago to my Steelers. You know, week six or week five, the Steelers ran them off the field, and then Cleveland came back in the postseason and beat the Steelers down. And then just last week, um, we saw um, Tampa Bay beat New Orleans when New Orleans had beaten them down twice previously in the regular season. So it just goes to show what happened in the regular season really goes out the window. Um, those are just some interesting nuggets um, that I thought were important to bring up. Now for this game, um, as you mentioned, it's a matchup of two legendary quarterbacks, both of which are playing some of their best football down the stretch um, here. Um, Aaron Rodgers during the Packers seven game winning streak, including lap, which includes last week um, against the Rams. He's completing 75% of his passes, 21 touchdowns, one interception with a quarterback rating of 125. Just about if you round it up, um, which is insane. And then on the other side, Brady, um, on this uh, since the week 13 by week, so week 14 on, uh, the Buccaneers are 6 and 0. Um, he's completing 65% of his passes, 18 touchdowns, just one interception, with a quarterback rating of 117.4. So if you were to ask these quarterbacks, I'm sure. I mean, both of them are legendary. Both of them have had fantastic careers. But I'm sure if you were to ask them, um, can you recall a five or six, seven game stretch where you have played this well in your career? Um, they'd be hard pressed to do it. That's just how well uh, these two guys are playing. Now, I think it's going to be tough for Tampa Bay um, to win this game. I think they can keep it close. But I just think, I mean, if you look at the Packers and what they've been able to do, mainly on, uh, on offense, they're first in time of possession, which means they keep the ball away from the opposing offense. So Brady's only going to get a limited amount of opportunities, um, and they don't turn the ball over. Um, Green Bay has one turnover in their past seven games, and they control time of possession, about 33 minutes per game. So they're not going to give Tampa Bay extra opportunities and they're not going to turn the, or by turning the ball over and they're also going to control time of possession. Um, I do expect Tampa Bay to stick to what worked in week um, six, that week six matchup. In that week six matchup, they blitzed Aaron Rodgers on 40.5% of the Packers' offensive snaps. And on those snaps, um, Rodgers went 3 out of 12 completions. So that's a 25% completion percentage. 2.3 yards per attempt, no touchdowns, and two picks. Those two picks were thrown on back-to-back drives um, after the Packers actually took a 10 nothing lead. Um, so they were very effective in blitzing him, making him make bad decisions, um, and it worked. I fully expect Tampa Bay to do that again. That's what they've done all season. Their top five in blitz percentage, I think they ranked third in that category, so they blitz a lot, and I think they're going to try to do that again. Um, but if you look at Aaron Rodgers versus the blitz against all other teams, 
not named Tampa Bay, he's been darn good, uh, completing 67% of his passes, 8.3 yards per attempt, 15 touchdowns, only one pick, and a quarterback rating of 124. So I think it's just whether or not Tampa Bay can replicate that success of getting to Aaron Rodgers and making him make a bad decision or two. I think that's really all this takes. When you have a great a legend like Tom Brady, when you're going up against the prolific offense like um, Green Bay, I think all you have to really do to actually get over the hump and win this game is to force maybe one turn, get that one extra possession, or that those two extra possessions that you might need to actually walk into Lambeau and pull out this game. But I do think Green Bay is going to end up winning. Tampa Bay is going to keep it close. We want to see close games, and I think both of these games are going to be relatively close. Um, I'm predicting Green Bay to win 30-24. Um, to 24. That's just um, my gut, what my gut is telling me. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's kind of how I break this down. For the Bucks. you just got to – Replicate your success versus the Blitz. Um, you're not going to stop Devontae Adams, as we've seen. Not even, you know, Jalen Ramsey could do it. And that Rams defense was the first ranked pass defense in the league uh, going into that game last week. You're not going to totally shut him out, but you can slow him down. And I think um, you just have to replicate that success, get to Aaron Rodgers, make him make a mistake or two, and let Tom Brady – the greatest of all time, do the rest. So whoever wins, I don't really have a rooting interest. Uh, it will be Tom Brady's 10th Super Bowl appearance. <laughs> and his, um, yeah, and it will, um, Aaron Rodgers is looking to get back to his uh, second Super Bowl. So interesting game. That's how I break it down, and that's my prediction. Dang, isn't it crazy that Aaron Rodgers has only been to one Super Bowl? That's wild. That he, I think he's like one in four, or one in five in uh, uh, conference title games. That's he's, that's just he's crazy a, to me. Well, let's see. He's played in. I think he's yeah, yeah. Um, he played yeah. So yeah, I think he's one in three. Uh, he's played in four, all of them on the road. He played in that – it was 2013 or 2014. Um, against the Seahawks, right? Against the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. Uh, they played 2016 against that Falcons team. Right. And then that. last year. And they played um, – they played uh, – The Niners. The last year. So right. those are the three losses. Um, and then his one win was. I think it was against Chicago. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Super Bowl and they beat the Steelers. Right. So he's playing three. Now they did go to another um, conference title game, but that game Rodgers really didn't play. Um, that was when Brett Favre was the the quarterback, but that was early, early. Um, I think that was like 2007. Or something like that. Yeah. Went to the title game, but um, Rogers obviously didn't play that game. Anyways, um, is that all we have to say on this game? Um, a couple of impact players to keep an eye on. Um, Vita Vea returns for the Bucks this week. He's their big uh, defensive tackle in the middle. He really helps out in the run defense. And then uh, Jair Alexander, the Packers corner. He's um, he's given up. I think a 50% completion percentage the entire season. I think that that's like as good as it gets for this era of football. Like that's as close to shutdown as you're going to get. So keep an eye on those two guys. I think that they could play, make a big impact. Absolutely. So yeah, in terms of just to remind y'all, uh, my score prediction is Green Bay 30, um, Tampa Bay 24. I really don't. Uh, actually go back when we make predictions like these I actually don't go back to the podcast afterwards and listen to what I actually predicted I'm going to try to do that this week 
So uh, 30 to 24 Green Bay, because I'm just curious to see how close or how bad I actually am at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think I'll try to do that too. Because I, so. I think there was one week where we got the score like exactly right for a game, I think on Sunday Night Football, like a few weeks ago. But other than that, I I, I can't name a time where I've actually – like looked at what score we picked. So um, for the score for this game, I'm going to say Green Bay mm, 27 to 24. It's going to be snowing, so I, I don't feel comfortable like saying somebody's going to get the 30. I'll, I'll keep it in like mid-20s range. And that's another factor um, that's really not going to matter in this game. The weather is really a non-factor. Um, Brady – Pretty much his entire career has played in these types of conditions. Um, when he played for the Patriots and Foxborough, similar type conditions um, this time of year um, to Lambo. So, and Aaron Rodgers obviously um, is comfortable playing in these frigid conditions. So, the weather, as opposed to last week, where it may have you know played a factor um, with that Rams team in. The, Obviously, Jared Goff, who has some pretty horrendous numbers and freezing temperatures. Uh, but that's a story for another day. Uh, these two quarterbacks won't be phased. Um, that just came to mind. So with that, we'll move on. Um, going to another um, cold-weather city and a matchup between two cold-weather teams. Um, the AFC Championship on CBS tomorrow evening. Um Two seed Buffalo Bills trying to get to their first Super Bowl in 27 years. Wow. And uh, the Chiefs obviously trying to defend their title and repeat, which is really hard to do um, nowadays. Yeah. So um, this is going to be a great game. Um, do you want to start with your thoughts on this game? Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm just going to start by um, comparing what happened week six and pointing out the things that are different this time around. Um, the Bills held the Chiefs under 30 points last time. I don't know if they're going to be able to do that again at, in Kansas City. Um, another thing is uh, Tremaine Edmonds, the Bills um, star linebacker, he was – dealing with a shoulder injury. He was playing through a shoulder injury, so he wasn't playing up to his standard. Um, So I expect him to be guarding um, Travis Kelsey most of the game. So that'll be a big factor as well. Um, But as for the actual X's and O's, uh, I think this game is just going to come down to who can get touchdowns in the red zone, especially for the Bills. in order to beat a, a great team, great teams in general, or, or especially the Chiefs, um, you have to score touchdowns and you have to play aggressive. Um, you saw the Browns a few times last week go forward on fourth down inside their own 50. And I mean, and for me personally, I probably would have done the same thing they did. I mean, it, you have to be extremely aggressive and, and, take the game into your own hands when you have the ball because you can't rely on your defense to get stops. Like as confident as you are on your defense, you have to be realistic and get points when you can. Um, but with all that being said, um, I'm, I'm just excited for this matchup just based on the quarterback matchup. This, this is going to be, I think this is the game where you're going to see whether Josh Allen is has truly cemented himself as elite or not because you can have a great season and then and then fall off in the in the playoffs and you see guys have go back to being their regular selves the next year like is this him or is it just a anomaly season but I th- I think he's going to come out and he's going to show out um the the first two playoff games he didn't play his best football. I think he's gonna come out with like a chip on his shoulder. And I think you could maybe see the Bills go out and get a lead early. I think that might be the case. Maybe get out to like a ten nothing lead 
and then I can I think the Chiefs will come back, and I'd say the Chiefs will win like uh, 41 38. This is, oh, I think this is one of the more intriguing, interesting, going to be one of the more entertaining AFC championship games that we've had in recent memory. Um, I know we had the game two years ago um, where the Patriots, uh, that crazy game where the Patriots won in overtime um, and advanced to the Super Bowl. Uh, that year, Patrick Mahomes MVP year, um, the year before last, that was one of the better AFC championship games I've watched in the past 10 years. Um, but I think, yeah, this has an opportunity to be like that, that type of game. Um, I think you hit it right on the head. Um, the red zone battle is pretty much what this game comes down to. Um, if you look at it from the Bills' perspective, in terms of defensively, um, since week 12, they've been the best red zone defense in the league, the entire league. And Kansas City, as of late, um, has really struggled, for, especially for a team like Kansas City, with all that talent offensively. They've really struggled to convert red zone opportunities into touchdowns. I mean, we saw it just last week. Look what the Browns were able to do when the Chiefs threatened um, inside their 30, 20, 25-yard line. They held them to field goals. They made Harrison Butker kick field goals, and that's how they were able to hang around in that game. And since week 12, in that same time span, the Bills are the best red zone defense in the league. Chiefs are one of the worst red zone offenses in the league. They rank 26 um, since week 12 in red zone touchdown scoring percentage. So I think that's really the matchup that I'm watching um, when Kansas City gets into the red zone because you're going to move the ball in this Buffalo defense. It's kind of the Buffalo defense has kind of developed that bend but don't break mentality. Um, I mean the the Colts move the ball up and down the field in that wild card matchup. They just didn't convert some of those uh, red zone opportunities into touchdowns. And same thing last week with Baltimore. They drove inside the Bills' 30-yard line five times, and they were only able to come away with three points. Um, you had the Lamar pick six, and then a couple other, you know, the Justin Tucker missed field goals, which is pretty rare. Um you know, some missed opportunities in the red zone um, was basically the story of the game. And that's been the story of the Buffalo defense. If you're going to move the ball, Kansas City's going to move the ball up and down the field. Buffalo's going to give up yards, but it's whether or not the Kansas City offense has been struggling mightily um, to score in the red zone for the past, I don't know, four or five weeks. Um, they're able to convert those into touchdowns, well, it's going to be hard for Buffalo to win because you're asking Josh Allen with pretty much zero running game, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, um, to to go toe-to-toe toe, toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes. Um, but, yeah, I think that's really what this game comes down to. Um, for Buffalo, uh, I just – I think you hit it right on the head. You're really going to see whether Josh Allen is elite. I think he, they've been asking him to really put the team on his shoulders. Um, the Bills are dropping back to pass on 73% of offensive snaps so far in these playoffs, which tells you they've kind of abandoned the running game. Why? Because they really have no running game. If you look at it, as good as their offense has been, um, they're only averaging 64 rushing yards per game in these two playoff games. All the other remaining playoff teams, the, the Packers, the Bucks, and the Chiefs are averaging um, over 120 rushing yards per game. Um, so they're really kind of struggling to run the football. Um, if you're Kansas City, the only real um, – 
threat, I guess, you have to worry about in the uh, running game is Josh Allen and his ability to extend plays uh, with his legs. Um, that's really all you really have to worry about at this point with this Buffalo running game. Um, so I think it's just Kansas City's offense ability to convert red zone chips into touchdowns better than they have in the past at least. Um, and Buffalo's ability to, uh, I guess, um, have some semblance of a running game and then their ability to do what they have been doing on defense. And that is keep um, the in-city offense out of, out of the end zone. So in terms of my prediction, I think it's going to be a little bit um, – more lower scoring than people think. Um, I'm going to say Kansas City 27, Bills 23. They will hang around, um, but I think it's just going to be too much. Now, I picked Chalk. I picked both one seeds to advance to the Super Bowl, um, Packers and Chiefs. But let me say this. I will not be one bit surprised if we see one, one upset, um, I'll be a little bit more surprised if we see two upsets, meaning the Bills and the Bucks both win. I don't think that's going to happen, but I will not be one bit surprised if we see an upset. Um, but I think I'm just hoping for two great games. And how about that Super Bowl? Huh. Packers, Chiefs. Woo! Yeah, that that's the Super Bowl we wanted last year. Mahomes versus Rodgers. And, and you know, the funny thing is it seems like we never get the Super Bowl that we want. So that might tell you something about where we might be going this weekend. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, Anything else you have to say for uh, Bills at Chiefs? Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you on your score prediction. I think it's going to be – I think I – Underest- I think I'm underestimating their the defenses a little bit too much. I think they're going to get a lot of yards, but maybe not as many points as I originally said. So I'm going to change my score to like uh, 30 to 23 Chiefs. That sounds about right. I think it's going to be right in that range. Uh, I think you said it. Um, if the, if the Chiefs get to 30 points, it's going to be really tough for the Bills to win. Right. Uh, I think if they can keep them under 30 points, like I had in my prediction, they'll have a chance at least going into the fourth quarter. Um, if they can keep it within one possession, they'll definitely have a chance. Uh, but if it gets up there near 30 points, it's going to be tough for Buffalo because you're just throwing all that on to Josh Allen's shoulders. And as good as he's been, um, I believe this would be like the the second lowest um, average, like the Bills would have the second lowest average rushing yards per game for a team to reach the Super Bowl like ever if they were to win, um, which is – I just think you're throwing too much pressure on that Josh Allen shoulders. As good as he's been this year, you can make a case, a strong case for him um, to win MVP, even though I don't think he will win. Um, you could definitely make a strong case for him to get some votes. Um, you're just throwing too much pressure onto him um, to ask him to keep up with Kansas City. But um, with that, I'm not sure how many minutes we have gone. Yeah, it's, that's 29, and it's going to cut off at 30. So I guess we're going to take a short break here, guys, and we're, when we come back, we're going to get into um, the the trades, that the possible QB movement we could see this offseason, Matt Stafford, Deshaun Watson. Um, that's yeah. Have y'all ever thought about starting your own podcast but thought it would be too complicated? If your answer to that question is yes, let me tell you about Anchor. Anchor is the easiest way to start a quality podcast. First of all, it's free. 
There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from any device. And on top of that, Anchor is owned by Spotify, so you have access to a full library of sound effects, background music, transitions, and even full songs that you can add in. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, and it will hook you up with sponsors so you can make money on your podcast. It's literally everything you could ever need to start a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. Okay, we are back, y'all. Um, like I said, we're going to get into these uh, QB trade rumors. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Michael start off here. Obviously, we have the, the Deshaun Watson trade rumors. Um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. And also, um, a story came out yesterday that the Lions are going to be working with Matt Stafford to get a trade um, worked out with somebody. Um, and we could also see some QB movement out of Philadelphia this offseason as well. So there's, there's a good bit of possible QB movement here. Yeah, I think I saw a stat earlier that if Stafford gets moved and if um, – yeah, Stafford gets moved and someone else gets moved, only like five quarterbacks would be on the same team. Um, that they were on five years ago, which is the, the amount of quarterback turnover that we've had the past couple of years has been absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, we we've had a lot of retired play, a lot of retiring QBs, and like just lot, all of the of young stars. Yeah, right, and all yes. the mid pack QBs. I think they're they're always moving around too. So. Um, let's just get right into the the biggest, um, the best player to be put on the trade market, allegedly, Deshaun Watson. So I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead here. Well, I think the big question here is, well, we already have heard, and in case you haven't heard, the two rumored preferred destinations for Deshaun Watson are uh, – his number one is the New York Jets. He likes the hiring of Robert Sablaw, um, the previous 49ers defensive coordinator. Um, we will get to the coaching hires in a soon future episode. Uh, but he likes that hire. And then if not the Jets, he wants the same division, the Miami Dolphins. Um, that's just for our viewers' information. If you have not heard, those are the two preferred destinations that have been reported. Now, I think the big question here is, what do you have? <laughs> what, like, huge um, – what is the value of Deshaun Watson? Like, I'm not sure in my lifetime there has been another quarterback – on the trade market of his caliber. I mean, he's a, I mean, you look at the Texans this year and they, they're pretty bad, but you look at Watson's numbers. If you were to just look at Watson's numbers, you would think that's a playoff team. Like that's how good he's been. Right. Um, I'll have the, his exact stats. I'm not going to pull him up right now, but he was really, really good. He was elite in terms of um, statistical output. Um, this year, so I think the real question is, what is the what is the output? What do you have to give up? Um, I was listening to something, um, a show or something, a podcast earlier this week, and they mentioned like, what if you just gave up a first round pick for every year that Deshaun Watson is on your like that's. I mean, think about it. Yeah. If, if Jamal Adams is worth two first-round picks, if a safety and an offensive lineman, Laramie Tunsil, are worth two first-round picks, what is a quarterback um, of Deshaun Watson's caliber worth? What, five, six first-round picks? I mean, is that really what we're looking at here? I don't know. Um, it could be. Yeah, I think um, I think you have to look at the Jamal Adams trade and then – May, like maybe even like triple that. Like I think you gotta put 
you got to give them preferably a quarterback in return um, and probably three or four first round picks, three or four seconds, and maybe even a third. Like there, like there's no way to quantify how valuable Deshaun Watson is. Cause he's literally like, he's in his prime and he's like, if anything, he's probably before his prime, to be honest. Right. That's the, yeah, I yeah. think, and that, that's why that exact reason is why I think, um, he has these two, maybe he or his agent or whoever it is, um, have leaked these preferred trade destinations, um, the Jets and the and the um, Dolphins. Why? Because as you mentioned, I mean, it's going to take probably five, six, seven, whatever it is, first round picks, a lot of first round picks, and probably a young quarterback prospect. And what do the, both the Jets and the and the uh, Dolphins have? They have young quarterbacks that they can. Give Houston to potentially, um, I guess, expedite what they're trying to do in rebuilding that team. Um, you have Sam Darnold that you could ship off in a trade, and you have Tua you could ship off in a trade. Um, now, I think what happened, what actually happens, uh, they're going to have to hire a head coach first, and what that head coach um, is able to do. Um, I don't think this relationship, is, it doesn't seem salvageable at this point. But if they could bring in a head coach who could try to work with Watson, I think that should be the goal for Houston. Um, try your best to salvage this relationship. And if it doesn't work, that's when you, you trade him. I think you got to wait as long as possible. Um, but I think he's just going to force their hand and they're going to have – He's going to be gone, you know. It'd be nice if they could do this by the draft. Then they could get possibly, uh, they could move up um, in this draft and draft a quarterback. That'd be nice. Um, They could get a a couple first-round picks and, you know, move up to where the Jets are picking or um, where the Dolphins are picking. I believe they have number two and three picks respectively. So the Texans could move up. If they were to work out this trade before this draft, they could move up and possibly take like a Justin Fields and then or whoever and then have maybe also like a Sam Darnold or a Tua Tagovailoa on their roster. And they'd be set at quarterback moving forward, um, at least for the next couple of years, to try to figure out who that future franchise quarterback is going to be. I think that should be the goal. Hire a coach, see if you can salvage it, and then if not, try and trade him before the draft. So you can get – you can trade up in this draft to try and draft a quarterback because this quarterback draft class is deep. Um, right. There are five or six guys that could potentially go in the first round. So um, – and a lot of quarterback needy teams. And if you want to get to the elite of the elite, you got to be able to um, acquire that draft capital to move up. And the two rumor destinations – um, and this could be strategy as well on Watson by Watson's camp um, to try and incentivize uh, the Texans to trade him to those teams because of their draft positioning. And the Texans, I guess, could go get their feet. But I'm ranting at this point. You get the point. Yeah. I, I just think it's hilarious that the Texans could literally just trade for their pick back after all of that. <laughs> That uh, oh my goodness! Uh, trading your 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 franchise basically for for your just to get your first round pick back that you traded away. Oh my goodness! Yeah. It, oh man! It, just think about all of those years where Houston had a great roster and just couldn't get the quarterback right, and then now you find the diamond. The, the one that, that's supposed to be the savior, Deshaun Watson, and then you screw everything up. Just, just wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, there's no other way to just, oh, man. I, I just think, I just feel bad for all the Houston fans that, oh, my goodness, have to go through 
maybe trading their two star players of their city, James Harden and Deshaun Watson, within a few months. Shout out to uh, Noah and uh, Prayog. They they were they came, been on the show before. They're both huge Houston fans. I can't imagine what that must be like right now. And for the Astros fans too, they lost George Springer this week. So yeah, you're you're potentially losing um, <laughs> one of the best players on your baseball team, uh, the best player um, on your basketball team, and your franchise quarterback on your football team. So rough couple week or rough couple months to come, I guess for Houston, um, but. That's beside the point. I think um, – what was I going to say? Um, I think you really have to look at why is why is Deshaun Watson one out? Like, we know we know they they had a bad year this year and they went 4-12 and, and didn't win a lot of games. That could definitely play a part in this and probably does. Um, but I think the root of this is, is, is really – I guess over um, management and like the the front office. I think that's really what his problem is here. Um, not giving him the proper input that he thinks he should have over this coaching hire, um, over that GM hire that they made with. They didn't even uh, the reports say that they didn't even talk to Watson about it. Um, he wasn't very happy about that. I think there are a lot of factors here that play into this, which is why I think it makes uh, this relationship, I guess, practically impossible um, to sell. This is just one of those things where you have a star player and you're just going to have to throw him out there, uh, gauge the market for him. You're going to get five, six first-round picks minimum, if I had to guess plus probably more. Um, so I don't think the value you're getting in return is going to be a problem. You're going to get as much as you can for a player like this. Um, it's not going to be one of those DeAndre Hopkins situations where you just throw them out there for a bag of chips, a pack of Lay's and a, um, and a Sprite. You know, Sprite or whatever, or Dr. Pepper. But um, yeah, you just, I think, all those factors playing into this just make this all the much harder to salvage. Um, I think it's probably going to end up being um, the Jets or the Bills. Um, think about it. I mean, that division, I mean, the Patriots don't have – I think if you're the Patriots, now this is where it gets interesting. How – what do you do if you Bill Bell? Like, are you really going to let – um, the Dolphins or the Jets uh, like trade for Deshaun Watson. I mean, if you look at this, uh, I guess, I mean, I don't know what the Patriots' plan is, but, uh, you know, the, the Cam Newton experiment didn't work out very well. Um, you need a quarterback. Are you just going to wait to draft one? Are you going to get it on this too? Um, what's, like, I don't know. It's just like an interesting storyline. Um, what is Bill? What is Bill Belichick thinking through all of this? But that's beside the point. Um, I think let's shift over to Matt Stafford, another another big name. That's unless you have something else you want to say. Um, I, one other team I wanted to throw in, since we're starting to throw in teams here, is the Niners. Think about this. So. If you're the Niners, would you be willing to put Joe – no, uh, not not Joe Bosa, Nick Bosa in a deal? Because if you put Nick Bosa in the deal, then you probably don't have to give nearly as many draft picks. If you put – if you say put Nick Bosa, um, Jimmy Garoppolo, and then just give them your next year's, like, draft slate. I don't like who – like – Give them everything. I mean, um, if you're the Niners, like you, you kind of just have to bet that your roster is like already Super Bowl caliber since you just went to the Super Bowl last year and you were what seven points away, ten points away from winning the Super Bowl. So 
that I think that's were, a possibility as well. They were they were um, basically a quarter away from winning the Super Bowl. Right. They were up by ten, I believe, going into the fourth quarter of that game. Um, so they were very as close as you can come um, to winning the Super Bowl. And that roster, when healthy, is Super Bowl ready. Like they are ready to contend now. So I mean that I forgot to even mention them um, is really intriguing. Um, if you if you could package, um, I mean that pa- the Texans. I mean JJ Watt's getting old now. Is kind of banged up. Uh, you got to rebuild that defense too. Uh, uh, Nick Bosa is a good place to start, and then you you get probably four or five draft picks added on top of that. Um, so uh, to start rebuilding that defense and, of course, um, to find the offense that you want. Um, yeah, that that the, all four of those destinations um, are really intriguing. Now, I think Patriots are probably the least likely. I was just – I just brought that up because – I don't know. It's interesting because now you have Josh Allen in that division. You could potentially have uh, uh, Deshaun Watson in that division. And then another young quarterback, whether it's Tua or Sam Darnold, whichever team doesn't get. Um, or or it could be Zach Wilson or um, yeah, Justin Fields. I mean, right. we don't know. So um, I just brought that up because it's interesting to think about it. I mean, what is Bill Bel- what's Bill Belichick's strategy through all this? Um, I think the Jets, the Bill, the Jets, uh, the Dolphins, the Niners. I'm trying to think of any others uh, before we quickly move on. To the that step. Bears, maybe, but I don't think they have enough uh, pieces they could throw at. The Bears would be interesting. Uh, Matt defense and a creative mind and Matt Nagy. I think. Uh, that would be interesting, but I'm not sure Watson would want that. Um, I think you could go to 90% of teams and ask them if you would take Deshaun Watson over their quarterback, and most of them would. Sim- oh, yeah, simply sure. from the fact that he he's so young and he's already so good. For sure. For sure. So, um, so with, yeah, go ahead. Well, I guess – I guess for teams that don't end up getting Deshaun Watson, which will be, I guess, all except for one, I guess. Right. Uh, we have Matthew Stafford, um, another um, quarterback um, that just like recently, the news came out that the Lions and Stafford are mutually parting ways. Um so they've decided to go in their separate ways in the, in the next couple of weeks. The um, Lions are going to field trade offers for Stafford. And I'm sure um, the offers will come plentiful. Um, there are plenty of teams I can think of that could use a veteran bridge quarterback that Bridge type quarterback that I guess you could call um, Matthew Stafford. He's only 32 years old. He can give you three or four years of really good quarterback play at least. Um, he's under control for two more years, so you could you could trade for him and then rework an ex- rework an extension uh, beyond these next couple years. Um, so you get you get control. Um, you get all his production. Really, the only thing Matthew Stafford hasn't done in his career is win. And that's because he's been in Detroit his entire career. And when's the last time Detroit won anything? Like, seriously. I mean, they never. The <laughs> like, never. Right. So, I think, he's, I think he's really excited to get out of Detroit and get to a contender where I think he can win. Uh, I saw a stat earlier. I think he's... The list of quarterbacks, I'll try to find it. You go ahead and give your thoughts, and then I'll, I'll read off the stat. Okay. Um, I think Stafford is 
I think he's a mid level quarterback at this point in his career. I think um injuries are definitely a question since he's already 31 years old. Um like he's been relatively healthy, but he he it seems like he always has nagging injuries that he's playing through, like back and like shoulder and like it it's always something different. Um but if you put a great team about around Matthew Stafford, like I truly believe like they can have a shot at a Super Bowl. Like I don't know if they'll win, but you you have a good shot. Um here here's the thing though. Um it just depends on what you're you're giving up in terms of you don't want to hinder the roster you're putting him into because um, he needs a good roster to win. You know, he's he's going to need a great roster to go contend. So um, I think a team like the Colts would work really well. Uh, Phillip Rivers just retired. So that would be a, a dream fit. But um, beyond that, though, um, I don't really know if you, if you trade for Matt Stafford if you're the Niners. I mean, Jimmy Garoppolo is on a – cheaper contract than Stafford is. I don't know if it's really worth it. Yeah, I think about some other teams. The Colts are definitely um, probably the most intriguing fit here. Um, good running game, um, good, great coach, good offensive line, um, above average um, weapons, um, good defense. I think that's really the dream fit here for Stafford. Um, and you could you could have you go into that division uh, with no with not having to worry about uh, Deshaun Watson. So right. I think that's really also a dream scenario. Uh, I've heard people bring up Pittsburgh. I don't. Well, I'll say that for another day. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, in order for that to happen, Ben would have to um, hang it up retire that even to have a chance of happening uh the way the cap situations um, work out the Steelers would have to either have to cut which they're not going to do or they would have to retire um, i've heard that i would like it but i don't think it's going to happen um i don't they're not going to trade them in division so that takes out chicago right basically. um I don't know. What about, I mean, we don't know for sure what Breeze is doing. Um, we think that it's going to be um, Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill taking over that role, but we don't know really what's going to happen in New Orleans. Um, how could that potentially fit? I don't know. Um, it's hard to think of any other scenarios that come to mind, but I found this stat just to put, I guess, the level of success, or I guess when you think about Matt Stafford, you think like above average, but not great. Right. Uh, Just like struggle to win games, not great. It's dealt with some injuries, but the only quarterbacks in NFL history with, uh, and this could be just like a pointless stat, but I found it pretty wildly surprising. The only quarterbacks in NFL history with 45,000 plus passing yards and less than 150 interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, Matthew Stafford. In the bliss. Wow. Really? That, that, wow. That is, <laughs> aside from sources, that's according to CBS Sports. Okay, so 4,500 – wait. 45,000 plus. Oh, plus okay, yeah, 45,000. I was like, <laughs> yeah. And less than 150 interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, Matthew Stafford. Wow. Okay, yeah, that that kind of entails what Matthew Stafford is. He, he's always been a, a money – fantasy quarterback because he, he gets those stats 
but yeah, he throws a lot of yards. He's actually uh, seven straight seasons with the uh, four thousand plus passing yards. So he throws for a ton of yards, and he throws. You know, he'll get you those touchdowns. He'll you know two to one, maybe a little over a touchdown to interception ratio. He's pretty good statistically. Um, it's just you got to get him a better roster than they had down there in Detroit, right? Uh, to be able to win, he's not. He's not good enough to overcome average. Right. He, he's he's got to have a great roster. And another thing is um, that people aren't really taking into account is that the fact that the NFL is changing. Like people want mobility at the quarterback position, and he's not going to be able to bring that to the table. So that's one thing that maybe um, – comes into play when teams are choosing between trading for a guy like this, when teams are choosing between trading for a guy like this and uh, drafting, say, a Justin Fields or or anyone in this draft who has, has good mobility. Yeah, interesting. Um, so I think if they don't trade them by, like, March, middle of March – um, they owe him a certain amount of money. So I expect, I think it's like 10 or $12 million they owe him. They don't trade him by a certain date, in like the middle of March. So I expect this trade to happen relatively soon. Uh, I expect the Lions to uh, field those calls, um, see what they can get, and probably take the best of the offers. Um, kind of play the waiting game for a little bit and then um, see what Stafford wants and then um, trade him within the next couple of weeks. Right. Uh, so when it happens, I'm sure we'll talk about it. Right. Um, are there any other quarterbacks that you want to talk about before we uh... – Um. Well, there there is one. Um. This one may not be as interesting for most people, but – Gardner Minshew, I mean, I think he he's not – I think he's a duct tape quarterback. Like, I, I think he's like a Teddy Bridgewater type of quarterback to where if you want to be competitive but still rebuild like what the Panthers did this year, bring in Gardner Minshew, maybe win like five, six games. I think I think that's kind of – I think that's kind of why his market isn't going to be as big. But I, I'd honestly like to see him get a second chance, maybe with like New England or something like that. That would be a, a good good destination, I think. You put him in a system like that. You could see, I mean, they could win. I mean, what? They won. I mean, Gardner Minshew, you could make an argument, has been better statistically throwing the ball than Cam Newton has. Right. So, but. But the thing is, though, they got to get they got to get weapons. And um, the problem with Cam Newton was he his skill set um, made the New England's weakness even worse than it already was. Since his arm is so shot and he can't push the ball downfield as well as he used to, um, it made it like yeah. highlighted the problem that they had, which is they don't have any good receivers that can go downfield and win one-on-one matchups. So they, they got to get, they got to get receivers. That's like priority number one for them. That's an interesting one that I haven't really thought about at this point. Um, I don't know what, what the situation is in Philadelphia. Um, Like they just hired a new coach. I'm not too familiar. I have to before we do that coaching episode. I'm gonna have to do a lot of like research and what all these guys. I know some of them, but not all of them. Yeah, I think his name is like Ian Suriani or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Nick Suriani. He was the yeah. Colts offensive coordinator, but not really. Uh, it's kind of confusing. Like, yeah, because he he um he's never called plays before, which I, I find kind of wild. He was under Frank Wright for, you know, however long. So it's an interesting hire. I'm not too sure about it. I have to do more more research before I can actually speak my opinions. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, what's going on with Carson Wentz? That's an interesting dynamic. 
Um, we saw what Jalen Hurts was able to do um, towards the end of the season once they finally benched Carson Wentz. And we saw Doug Peterson's horrendous decision to pull him out. Uh, Jalen Hurts um, pulled him out of uh, that Week 17 game against what was it? Um, who were they playing? The Redskins? No, sorry. Football. Yes, it was the Redskins. The football team, not the Redskins. Oh, oh sorry. The, <laughs> the shirts, no skins. Um, anyways, yeah. Um, they brought in. I mean, you think about it. It's interesting because Suriani, um coached under Frank Reich, and Frank Reich was. Um, uh, the former, I guess, um, what was it, the offensive coordinator for Carson Wentz? So it's kind of interesting. Like they come from the same system. Is Suriani able to kind of mend some of the problems with Carson Wentz? We don't know. Is that part of the strategy here by by the Eagles? I don't know. Um, so what's the dynamic there? Um, there's also, you know, Philip Rivers retired. Uh, we don't know what Roethlisberger is going to do. Uh, we know, but we don't know what Breeze is going to do. There are reports that he's retiring, but he has yet to say himself what he's doing. Right. Uh, so there's that. Uh, so a lot of a lot of quarterback move. We'll just have to see what happens. We'll be back to talk about it as soon as it happens, as soon as we can. Um, just before we sign off, let's recap our predictions for tomorrow. I have Green Bay beating Tampa Bay 30 to 24, and Kansas City beating Buffalo 27 23. Right. And then you have kind of the same type thing. Right. Same same teams. Um, but yeah. one, one thing I want to ask you before we sign off here what what's your top Super Bowl matchup that you want, like, in order? Like, I'd say I want Rodgers versus Mahomes one, and then maybe Mahomes versus Brady two. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, definitely Mahomes, Rodgers one. <laughs> uh, number two um, – yeah, I think you'd have to go Mahomes Brady, and then you'd have to go maybe Rogers Allen, and then Brady Allen, that type of thing. Yeah, but um, but one thing that would be funny though about that uh, Brady versus Allen matchup is like the Bills, like for so many years they were terrorized by Tom Brady. Like, yes, we finally got rid of him. We won the division, and then <laughs> we got to play him in the freaking Super Bowl. <laughs> Like, gosh, yeah. damn it. That'd be funny. There are tons of – think about this. If Tampa Bay makes it there, uh, they play the Super Bowl at home. Like, yeah, that's insane. State. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, that, that's never happened before. I believe the closest a team has ever gotten to playing a Super Bowl uh, – I guess in their home stadium was uh, a couple years back when the Super Bowl was in um, was in Minnesota. Minnesota, yeah, right. And Minnesota got to the NFC Championship, but of course didn't win. Right. Um, so that's the closest we've gotten. So it'll be, it'll be uh, if Tampa Bay is in the game in the fourth quarter, man, the quarter's going to be going nuts. Um, I think they'll be going notes either way if it's a close game. But, yeah, if Tom Brady pulls this off, I think he's already some – like the Brady-Belichick argument is kind of kind of done now. Like, yeah, and, and it was a kind of a flawed argument to begin with. Yeah. But um, can't say that now. Yeah, we can't. Uh, it's kind of – we've seen that it's Brady, Brady or bust. Uh, pretty much. Um, so I think that's going to do it. Uh, episode 53 of the Raw Prospect Podcast. 
Um, leave a like, subscribe. Um, as always, like we we're really appreciative of like everybody who listens, and uh, we want it, we want to keep going and improving. So, like I, like we said at the beginning, if you have any suggestions for topics or like what what you want to see us do more in the future, um, definitely send that in to us. We we'd love yeah, we'd love to hear from y'all. Definitely a basketball heavy <laughs> future coming. I know we haven't talked much. NBA, um, but we'll get through the Super Bowl and then definitely a, a basketball heavy podcast wave coming. Um, but yeah, that is it. Yeah. See y'all. Peace.